stay tuned. God bless you. This is Rashad Cartwright of VirginiaPreachers.com and AmericaPreachers.com. Listen, there are very few times when I'm speechless, but when I'm sitting next to two intellectuals of none other than the Dr. Cornell West and Dr. Boykin Sanders, if you um, watch C-SPAN, CNN, read one of his books, um, he's published author, minister, keynote speaker, um, well-rounded, all-around great individual. Dr. Boykin Sanders, a professor here at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia, uh, PhD from Harvard University. Listen, Dr. West, I want to thank yeah, you so much. It's a blessing much. to be here, my dear brother Cartwright, and to be here with my dear brother and distinguished colleague and scholar, Dr. Boykin Dr. Sanders. Dr. Sanders, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Listen, I wonder if y'all can uh, fill us in about your relationship, how y'all met. I believe it's in college, correct? I was in college. He was in divinity school. And it was in biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's been quite a while. Um, how long would you say, Cornel? About 40 years ago. 40 years. <laughs> yes, in the, in the 70s, uh, yeah, when, we, we, uh, when we first met. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, we've been friends very much uh, since then. I want to I want to throw some um, topics out and some questions and get your um, your thoughts on them. Um, starting off with um, our president, President Barack Obama. I want to know um, your assessment. Um, he's a, a year in the office, a year and a couple of months. I want to get your assessment of what you think of his role and how he's handled things. I think he was handed such a difficult job. Uh, he had the legacies of Katrina, the legacies of the near Wall Street collapse, legacies of the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and the drone war in Pakistan. Uh, I would give him, I'd say, a, uh, an A for changing the image of America from a Bush administration-based image to an Obama administration-based image. I'd give him a, a B minus on domestic policy. He pushed through a health care bill, but it still was not what I would like in terms of poor and working people, but at least he pushed it through. I had deep problems with his economic team that's still too tied to Wall Street and not concerned enough with everyday people. And foreign policy, I think he's yet to make any major moves in, uh, with the exception of the nuclear agreement. Dr. Sanders. Uh, you know, at first I was um, very cool on, on Obama, you know, at the beginning of his uh, career, you know, as president and even before, you know, as he was campaigning. And one of the things I was concerned about is the fact that um, if you were generally uh, safe uh, from this country, uh, say if you had the history of uh, slavery in your background, if you had uh, the history of the struggle that we have had here. Uh, it was very difficult for America as such to hear you, you know, because of these kinds of concerns. And I remember struggling with that for, for some time because, you know, there was a question in the black community one time, is he black enough? Uh, and what about this and what about that? And I remember coming as a biblical scholar reading the question that Jesus himself um, once asked of his disciples, who do people say that I am? And then some said, you know, you are Jeremiah the prophet. Some said you're Elijah and so forth and so on. And then the question was raised, but who do you say I am? You see, and that was a question that the black community had, you know, for a considerable period of time. And then there was a response. Now, personally, I would not have <laughs> gone the way on Afghanistan and all of that, but I, I, I do think that he is, uh, he's, he's, he's making a little progress, uh, I would say, you know, nowadays, but I think that we have to be conscious of the fact that uh, there's a whole country out here that he has to deal with and a whole world he has to deal with. And so in that sense, I, I have a little bit more uh, sympathy and some compassion, you know, for him, you know, uh, now, as opposed to the time when he first, because I, I personally, I said to myself, you know, uh, it seems to me that anybody could come in this country except those of us who were born here, 
and to, to get in it, in it to make progress. You know, and that that is that's that concerned me at one time. But he seems to be moving along now a little bit. So let's give him about a beat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to throw this question out. Uh, I see on Facebook somebody asked me a question. Um, young black generation, do you think they are headed for destruction or do you think there is hope? Oh, I think there's hope. I think there's hope. There's so many magnificent young brothers and sisters of all colors, but especially young black brothers and sisters doing the right thing, working hard, trying to preserve a sense of history, trying to understand the legacy of Martin King and Malcolm X and Ella Baker and those who came before, it's just that they are not visible, they're not put out there enough. The white mainstream press is preoccupied with black failure, with black death, and with black pathology. And we got a lot of black life, we got a lot of black creativity, we got a whole lot of black critical intelligence and combative imagination. But it's not as visible. Thank God that you do what you do. And you can highlight some of the positive things that's going on. Because you got a whole lot of courageous and visionary young folk. They're hungry and thirsty to fight for justice. And that is the hope that we old school brothers you say, because we're going to go down fighting. Mm -hmm. But we want to pass it on to the younger generation like yourself and others. Yeah, I think you wanted to say something, Dr. Sanders. Yes, uh, what I was uh, about to say was the fact that uh, we have. Um, uh, destruction, you know, it's sort of like in the stream, uh, the American uh, stream, bloodstream, you know, today. And more uh, volatile activities, violence, and so forth. And a lot of our young people associated with that. But I was reading some scholar, I think, uh, some time ago, and there was a discussion about uh, understanding violence in our time. And what you have is, and somebody really needs uh, to analyze this, you have a situation where a, um, a group of people who have uh, come to life uh, after 500 years of not being heard from, and we still have to work out this you know, in our society yet. In other words, these are voices that have been smothered mm -hmm. for a considerable uh, long period of time, from the time of Columbus until now. And the question is, is whether we are willing, in some sense, to be patient with our young people as they work through this and that they move um, into the future. Yes, I do, I do think that young people will make it yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Sanders, going back to you on this question, what relevant message, um, being that we all are ministers, do you believe should be preached and is the number one highlight in the church? today? I think personally that our people have had a tradition of independence, you know, and it was in some sense prescribed by the situation of segregation and discrimination in the country. You know, in some sense, um, uh, when we do not have shoes and no one will give us any, then we will have to invent some for ourselves. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And I think that if we begin to do that and open, uh, if young people in some sense move in the direction and show in some sense that they, that we are faced with these issues, or if they can become conscious of the fact that we are faced with these issues, I think that we can move and begin to create an alternative life of some type. Well, let me first say though, that because I'm neither ordained nor licensed, that you all are actually bona fide ministers. I'm just a, um, a teacher. Yes, I have sir. a ministry of teaching. I'm a, I'm a late Christian, uh, but I'm not a, a called preacher okay, in yes. that sense. Uh, but if I were to preach, and I am often <laughs> asked to preach, even yeah, as a yeah. late Christian and as a, uh, as a black Baptist, uh, that for me is very much what um, Dr. Sanders, Professor Sanders, my dear brother Boykin Sanders said, that it's a matter of being called out because the church is to be in the world but not of the world. It's supposed to be over against the world, non-conformist. We are to be not well adjusted to injustice but mild adjusted to injustice. We are to cut against the grain because of our love and we should be known by our love. And because justice is what love looks like in public, 
We should be known by those who promote justice owing to the love inside of us. So the light that shines is in fact manifest in the deeds that are visible owing to the love and justice that we leave with the footprints that we make before we die. <clears throat> I want to throw out a word and uh, tell me what comes to your mind. Welfare. Investment bankers. Mm. They got corporate welfare. Mm. They got billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of your taxes, my taxes. His taxes, his taxes, his taxes. <laughs> Called welfare. Called corporate welfare. Corporate welfare. Keep the whole system going. Mm. And I would agree. Yeah, we need to highlight that because they always say welfare and related to poor people. Mm -hmm. Because when poor people fail, they have to deal with the consequences. Mm -hmm. When the well to do fail, they get bailed out. Healthcare reform. Well, we had to distinguish between health insurance and health care. Mm -hmm. What we got with health insurance reform, because insurance companies will actually benefit now. Everybody got to buy from them, so they get a bonanza. They get 30 million more people buying from them. They already make a uh, huge, huge profits they'll make now more, but the good thing is more people will at least be covered, so I'm glad that the Obama administration could put that, push that through. But in the end, we're going to, if poor people are actually going to be covered in the same way as I think congressmen and senators ought to be covered and old people are covered, then uh, we're actually going to have to have either competition with insurance companies, which is real health care reform, or we're going to have single payer. Uh, when I think about welfare, again, I think we, as Cornell has suggested, you're concerned about the care, you know, of individuals, you know, and um, you want to be sure that people survive, and uh, I think that is our duty and responsibility as Christian people to make that possible. I think if mm -hmm. we look at Jesus as a, as a New mm. Testament person, mm. I think that's what he was extremely concerned about, as the way that it is told in the New Testament, that he was concerned about welfare of human beings, whether it was the woman who had the issue of blood, or whether it was a man at the pool for 38 years waiting on the troubling of the water, just whatever it was that Jesus was concerned. And one of the things I like to even say about, about Jesus Cornell mm -hmm. is that he was, ex he was so sensitive mm -hmm. to the welfare of people that there was a woman pushing her way toward him. And he said that somebody touched him. He yeah. did not even see it. Yeah. Now, if the church can have a radar like that, to be sensitive to the community around it, mm. so much so that it does not have to see it, but sense it, mm. I like then I think that that would be very great. And I'm not sure whether churches are very, very much concerned about that now as it should be. Uh, and that is, uh, for, for that reason, I think that the, the prophetic uh, uh, dimension of the church or uh, the, the, uh, that prophetic side of the church uh, has been uh, diminished, you know, a tremendous amount because the prophets were very much concerned about the poor and the dispossessed and the distribution of wealth and care and healing. Mm. Jesus was concerned about healing, healing people, making them whole again, restoring them to health and wholeness and so on. <clears throat> yeah. and I think that the church should be concerned yes. extremely about that. Dr. West, let me ask you, what do you think can be done when you look at the increase of black on black um, of violence and you look in especially in the major cities, what do you think can be done and what do you think is not being done to um, prevent this and decrease it, especially in, on this black on black violence? Well, three things. One is that you have to control the guns and the drugs that are going in. Mm -hmm because much of the violence is tied to the buying and selling of drugs and the use of guns to protect various turfs for that buying and selling. So gun control on the one hand and much more uh, strong enforcement of the flow of drugs. Mm -hmm. The second thing has to do with the internal psyche of the people themselves, that our brothers and sisters who are involved in doing this tend to be those who perceive the world as a place where they have limited opportunities and therefore the only way they can really survive is to go underground and become involved in the underground economy.
Mm -hmm. so, that, so that if, in fact, we had massive quality education, massive quality housing, massive quality jobs, there would be m many fewer people who would opt for the underground. There's always going to be some who opt, but there would be much, much fewer mm. who would opt if they had opportunities, you see. And the third thing is to me just spiritual, you know, they just need to uh, undergo a conversion. Mm -hmm. You know, they need Jesus. <laughs> he said, Christian, they need he Jesus. He said, need Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus can turn a gangster like me around, can turn a drug dealer, a pimp, or anybody else around, and set them on the right way. Mm hmm no, I'm a living witness of that. Are you living witness? Oh, Lord, yes. I can testify <laughs> to that. I've been no, tested. Brother. Don't shout at me. Go ahead Lord. and shout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> now, uh, Dr. Sand, I think, I think he was going to uh, comment off of that. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, Dr. West talks about love as central mm -hmm. you know, to the mm -hmm. community. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm thinking more theologically and more biblically about the subject matter that we are talking about. And I think that would be, that's my little contribution to this conversation, you yes. know, that we, we're having tonight. Um, there is the, the idea that God is love, mm. you know, and there's also the concept that we are created in the image of God. Mm. And if we could indeed instill in our brothers and sisters once more that we are divine by nature, that God has created us, and that when we kill and destroy each other, we are actually battling against God. Mm. I think that if we could begin to teach a little more of that in our communities, where when you have abused somebody, or that you have mistreated someone, you have mistreated God. Mm. Now we are spiritual people, we have brought that with us when we came to this country. And there, and many of us still have that. But if we can begin to honor our concept of creation, that our divine maker in some sense made us, and that when we destroy each other and mess up each other, we are messing with the creator, the creator's self. And I think that is what we need to do in our churches on a consistent basis is to preach and teach that we need to have a healthier concept of God because in us there is a divine being. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Speaking on that declaration from the Governor McDonald, what was your thoughts on that when you heard that? I just thought here's another example of a, um, a white brother who exercises deliberate blindness and willful ignorance as if black mm. people don't count, as if black suffering doesn't matter. And so he could talk about the violent insurrection overthrow the U.S. government in order to preserve white supremacist slavery and forget about the slaves. <laughs> I said, come on, man. Yeah, yeah. This is 2010. You must be kidding. You don't realize that the whole war was centered on subjugating black people. And there's still black people in Virginia right now mm -hmm. who have not forgotten that those precious Africans and New World Africans were enslaved. And then, of course, he had to respond quickly. But you can see it was an afterthought. Afterthought. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in the initial. Not in the original mm. formulation. Mm. Uh, Dr. Sanders, the other day we had we was having a good conversation and we was talking about our black community. If you can expound on some of the thoughts and about your book mm -hmm. uh, regarding our community and where we are at. Mm -hmm. I thought that Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Kansas, was a critical turning point in black life in America. And for 50 years or more, we have been on that road trying to make one out of many. Um, that has been interpreted in many instances as a good Christian concept, trying to do that. And that's fine in idealistic situations. But when we have a history of racism in the country, as entrenched as it has been, then sometimes that does not work out because those people who have had a voice for example, in separate communities, 
are in some sense conscripted and mainstream, and therefore they lose in a lot in, in many instances the prophetic voice that they would have had because they are now mainstream. And so that is what I, I was greatly concerned that as we move beyond Brown versus Board of Education, that the communities that we had that Cornell talked about uh, in terms of Sacramento or Oklahoma, mm. you know, in mm. terms of this kind of strength in the neighborhood, yes, yes. it almost it disappeared because we are not controllers of the currency. There are other controllers who are dictating to us what we need to do and not do. And therefore, I think that the black church needs to work on that, yeah. that issue. Yeah. I had two more questions. Another question came from Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to know from Dr. West, uh, most of the presidents, our, our previous presidents, especially Bill Clinton, dealt with affirmative action. Uh, they said, what is your thoughts on um, President Obama seemingly, especially the first black president, to um, seem, seemingly to be avoiding the discussion of affirmative action. What is your thoughts? I think in general, uh, President Obama knows that he won the election in part because he was able to uh, speak to the fears and anxieties of white moderates, even as he capitalized on black support. So he holds many of the crucial issues connected with race at arm's length because he doesn't want to be identified too much with race because that would scare away the white moderates. And like any politician, he is concerned about elections, especially his own election. He mm -hmm. wants to win again. And so he treads very lightly. He walks on a tightrope. He's a very agile brother. He's a brilliant brother. He's a charismatic brother. And uh, he's got a tough job as president. So he doesn't want to get too identified with issues of race like affirmative action, let alone reparations, mm -hmm. you see, even as a lawyer. He knows there's a case for reparations <laughs> to be made, but he can't come out and say it. Yeah, see. yeah. Uh, and so I think it, it, it's going to be up to many of us to make the strong case for a whole host of issues uh, disproportionately connected with race to put pressure on him. Uh, so that he has to respond, but he has to respond in such a way that he understands we're fighting for justice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, justice spills over beyond the black community, but it does include the black community, and it needs to be uh, issues that both target the black community as well as target other communities. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, is your opinion the same way, Dr. Sanders? Well, yes, I, I, I do. Now, I would, I would say, um, you know, in, in my own classes, I talk a lot. So, I mean, don't we all talk a lot? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think the students yeah. would agree with that. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I, I am concerned. I, 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 I'm a biblical scholar, okay? Okay. And what I do is I try to sort of look for parallels, you know, in those traditions you know, vis-a-vis -vis where we are now okay. in our society. Uh, you remember the history of the Christian community uh, having gone through all sorts of persecutions because it was understood to be an excluded community. It was not a part of the Roman mainstream. But in the time of Constantine, it became a part of the Roman mainstream, and therefore the Christians were no longer persecuted. I personally see our history in a similar way. That we are, have been mainstream, we have come into the mainstream, too many of us, and there are prophetic voices are, ah, they are far, be, mm -hmm. few and far between. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I am, I, I look at uh, our history, you know, in slavery, mm -hmm. what we were trying to do was to leave the house. Mm -hmm. We were trying to leave the big house, so to speak. You remember, mm -hmm. you know, and we were happy. But the trick was this. Those of us, we fought in some sense to get rid of it, but we entered it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that is, that is, and now where is the voice of the church in all of this? And I think, you know, Cornell mm -hmm. is correct on this. Mm -hmm. You know, Obama is president. We are, he is, he is a part of the, the system. He has to carry out the systems. I mean, what the systems have designed for him. I mean, there's little changes or a little flexibility here or there. But the church must remain prophetic, yes, even yes, in yes. the case of Obama. That's right. We must speak 
because this is a system that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a system that has really suppressed and oppressed for so long. And many people are like walking dead people on the earth because of the fact of what is happening in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we still must speak and we still must organize and we still must remind even the President of the United States Absolutely. what the responsibility of the spiritual uh, component uh, is within our society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. West, um, mm -hmm. and I think this is probably my final question, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of the younger admirers, um, the, the one who looked up, looks up to you on Facebook, they, they want to know who is Cornell West? Uh, who is Cornell West? Um, they, uh, some of them asked um, your attire of your black suit, your white shirt, the black tie, the black vest, your black scarf. Um, uh, where did it start? Where did it come from? If you could tell us who, who is Cornell West? Mm. Well, I'm my mama's child, daddy's kid, Irene and Cliff West, out of Sacramento, Shiloh Baptist Church, Willie P. Cooks, my great pastor, shaped me, molded me, and my brother Cliff, who I've been trying to be like all my life, my two <laughs> precious sisters, Cynthia and Cheryl, and then my kids, Zaytun, my daughter, and my, my son, Clifton. Um, I think that uh, more than anything else, I try to be a blues man in the life of the mind, staying at the cross. A blues man is somebody who goes from city to city, bearing witness, trying to tell the truth, trying to inspire people, trying to encourage people, and empower empower people. I do it mainly with lectures, but the blues man or woman just does it with their voice. Uh -huh. Or the jazz man, the jazz woman does it with their instrument. And it's just part of the struggle for, for freedom that comes out of uh, the tradition that shaped me. And uh, my clothes are just basically a uniform. I'm on the battlefield all the time, uh -huh. willing to throw down. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'm also in the festival because I like to have fun. See, the battlefield and the festival go hand in hand. So I yeah. like to have fun and have a good time, just like the blues <laughs> man or woman. Yeah, yeah. But the blues man or woman got their uniform on and they got their they, 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 they peace. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It blows Lucille and B.B. King. Uh -huh. That's part of their armor. It's like the sixth chapter uh -huh. of Ephesians six twelve. Do you have on the whole armor? armor. Of God. Yeah. Put on the whole armor of God. I got my armor on. But it's got holes in it because I'm a crack vessel. Uh -huh. Just trying to love my crooked neighbor with my crooked heart before I die. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Faithful unto death through the cross. The blood that changed my life. Yeah. What word do you believe um, needs to be spoke and into their life? Some preacher that's watching that might feel like he's giving up or may feel like the world is on his back. Uh, what is it that you think is the, is the word of inspiration? Uh, I have been saying uh, just recently, we just passed through Palm Sunday, uh, a celebration, you know, in terms of the Christian calendar, that Jesus went to Jerusalem in the people's car, a donkey. He went riding on a donkey. Mm -hmm. And that was symbolic of something so that good. there, that we, in some sense, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, we have forgotten our prophetic ministry and that we really need to recover it and actually become, in some sense, examples and models for the people we serve. I was thinking about Dr. West. He has written his memoir. And one of the reasons for doing that is that somebody might see something or view something mm -hmm. that would give them some kind of guidance in times like these. I think that the Gospel of Mark was written because the Christian community at least 40 years from its inception, or maybe 50 years from its inception, had started to lose its way. And so Jesus becomes the first, the Gospel of Mark becomes the first picture show that the church went to. Because in that Gospel is portrayed what the Christian life is really all about. And Jesus went to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. And the stuff that was sort of spread out in terms of garments, it was not the red carpet, but the people themselves 
put their own kind of red carpet down. Mm, mm. And with palms of victory, they had overcome the world. And that meant, in some sense, that we are not of this world. We live in it, but it's our duty, in some sense, to dismantle it. Because that is God's call to us. That is God's call. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Sanders. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. West, your word. Um, your word, if, if it's for mm -hmm. a single mother um, trying to make it, if it's for a brother trying to feed and, and, and make ways, uh, someone is locked up. What is the word for the people? No, I think that um, all of us need to remember, and especially folk who at this moment are catching hell, that Jesus wept. And he wept because he loved so. He wept because he cares. He wept because he has a profound concern for your situation and mine. And we need to be in contact with that love. It was manifest in his life, it was manifest on the cross, and it was manifest on Easter. And if we stay in contact with that love, that God is love that Professor Sanders put forward such eloquence and the grace available to us, then we should be able to bear witness. And the old folk used to say, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you leave a little heaven behind. Mm. And that heaven you leave behind is the love in your witness. And it's measured in deeds. It's not measured in foliage or what you're wearing, but it's measured in the fruits that you produce, mm. which is manifest in the lives that you touch. Mm. Well said, Dr. West. Well yes, said. Sir. Salute you, brother, for the work you're doing. You're doing a mighty work here. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, indeed. And this brother here, anytime I get a chance to spend time with him, mm -hmm. my faith is fortified. Thank you so much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Listen, I want to thank you all for tuning in with um, Dr. Cornell West and Dr. Boykin Sanders. Um, Dr. Cornell West, his latest memoir, uh, Living and Loving Out Loud is available at all uh, major bookstores and on the web. Listen, I want you to tune in next week uh, for some exciting one-on-ones. Thank you for watching. God bless. Mm -hmm.